for the next hour, Thomas Campbell, author of My Big Toe Trilogy. Tom Campbell began researching altered states of consciousness with Bob Monroe uh, at Monroe Laboratories in the early 1970s, where he and a few others were instrumental in getting Monroe's laboratory for the study of consciousness up and running. These early drug-free consciousness pioneers helped design experiments, developed the technology for creating specific altered states, and were the main subjects of study all at the same time. Campbell has been experimenting with and exploring the subjective and objective mind ever since. He joins us tonight to talk about a variety of, of topics that we're going to be exploring with uh, higher consciousness. So welcome, Tom. Welcome back, actually. This is the second time we've had you on the show. Yes, thanks, Hillary. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Well, I have to say, it's always a fun time to talk to you. I, I, I really have enjoyed our conversations on the air and off the air. And uh, for those of you listening, Tom is also a fellow cast member of mine in the PATH series. And uh, we are releasing, actually this month, the second DVD in the series, The PATH, um, a Multiple Dimension. So we're going to be talking about a lot of things that have to do with those subjects tonight. I have a lot of great questions. And we are also live tonight. And if you have a question that you would like to ask Tom or myself, you're welcome to call in. The number is 888-235-7374. So Tom, let's kind of jump in. I want to, I've been wondering this and I know some people may be wondering too, why did you choose My Big Toe as the title for your book? <laughs> well, you know, uh, toe is a theory of everything and this is a theory of everything and it's a, it's a big picture theory of everything, which means um, uh, you know, not only does it have to explain science and uh, things like quantum mechanics and relativity, which are physics, which is where the original word toe came from as a theory of everything. It was, it was those trying to uh, combine relativity and quantum mechanics under one description, one uh, set of understandings. So it does that, but it also does consciousness and metaphysics and other things. So I call it a big toe. And then I put the my in front of it because until it's your experience, it can't be your knowledge. You can't really, what can we say, we can't really evolve your consciousness. You can't understand at a profound level until it's your experience. If you just read about it in a book, it's something you can believe or not believe, but it becomes your reality once it's your experience. So the my there is not to reflect, oh, it's mine, you know, and I did it. The my there is to say that it, to make it your own experience is required. And is it also bringing the person experiencing life back to themselves as the creator of their experience as well? Yeah, that is, uh, that's a good way to put it. Uh, we as consciousness, in many ways, create our own reality. A silence. Did you want me to go on with that? Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> I thought you were going to continue. <laughs> well, I, I can. But... <laughs> yeah. You know, there, there's I know, lots of ways. That, <laughs> there's lots of ways that we create our own reality. You know, one is because all of our reality is basically uh, data. You know, all the things that come into our eyes and ears and touch and so on. It's just nerve impulses and electrical signals and that kind of stuff. Light, um, it's all information, it's all data. And we have to interpret the data. And how we interpret that data is very individual. It depends on our experience, it depends on where we come from, our beliefs, our knowledge, all sorts of things. So how we interpret the data defines our reality. So yes, we do have some objective data, but then we have a lot of subjective interpretation. We also have feedback. So, you know, if we, let's say, are very kind and, uh, and understanding <clears throat> and uh, big-hearted people, then we find that people like us and like to be around us and enjoy us. And if we're just the opposite, if we're mean and, and uh, you know, unfriendly people, then people don't treat us very well. They stay away from us or they say mean things about us. So that way we create our own reality as well. Mm -hmm. So there's several ways that uh, that uh, we do that, but the, I guess the point is that each of us is walking around in our own personal reality because of these subjective aspects to what we call reality. So we're all in our in our own little reality, though we also share 
uh, certain aspects. It's a multiplayer game, so there are some things we share. But it's interesting to think that what we think is real out there is is really our own interpretation. And what do you say to people who find themselves in groups, you know, sharing common interests and common goals and and uh, kind of linked up to the same belief systems? How does that work? Welcome back. <laughs> Hello. Uh, looks like the computer just uh, went to zap. We had That's some technical fine. difficulties. Apologize. Um, so before we, we went to an unscheduled break, we were talking about uh, the data sets that people form according to their belief systems. And my question to you before we lost you was, what happens when we have groups of people that form kind of around an idea or a belief system? Um, how would you describe that in your uh, frame of reference within what you teach? Well, um, you know, we are all netted with each other. We all communicate with each other all the time, and particularly those people that we're associating with and interacting with. And all this is done in a nonverbal, and I don't mean body language. I mean, uh, you know, nonphysical when I say nonverbal as well. So when you have groups of people together, these groups, if they're all working on something uh you know, that reinforces each other, whether it's good or bad, they tend to pull each other up or drag each other down, you know, depending on, on which way they're headed. Uh, so you have a mob, you know, and that's a kind of mob psychology. Everybody's dragging each other down to the lowest common denominator. Or you have a group of people working on uh, oh, peace and, and uh, love and caring and taking care of others and that sort of thing, and they all just pull each other up. They all feel better and more... Um, successful at what they're doing by working together. So that's mm. uh, that's an artifact of consciousness being netted. We share. A group actually forms what's called a group consciousness, which is kind of the vector sum of all the individual consciousness that are in the group. And they encourage each other. Yeah, and can now how would one consciousness in a group like that change and shift the group consciousness? Well, they would do that by offering, you know, a better way of looking at something. And just by being there, by their example, by what they're doing and what they're saying, they can influence that group. Their their input, their thoughts are being traded back and forth all the time. They just have to make those thoughts appealing to the other members so that the other members kind of pick them up and go with them. So it's a it's a matter like like most things. It, it depends not so much on what you have to say as it is on how you say it, how you present it. So if it's if it's something that that the group likes and it they resonate with it, then the group will tend to to move in that direction. If it's not, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong or good or not good. If it's not something that group resonates, then they they won't attach to it. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that certain forms or expressions of consciousness have higher and lower vibrations of energy? Well, you know, that gets into to the, this word vibration. I think that's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking metaphorically, that's probably a, you know, a good statement to make. But that's not actual. Consciousness isn't, isn't vibrating. Vibration is a word that's defined in physical matter reality. It's a physical word. It means to, you know, move back and forth. It's not um, a word that really applies itself very well to consciousness in a literal sense. But yes, people have, you know, each person is a unique consciousness, a subset of the larger consciousness. And each is in a process of evolving their consciousness, growing up, if you will. Um, you might say, increasing the quality of their consciousness, becoming more spiritual. There's lots of ways to say that. Becoming love. Um, in my books, because I'm a physicist, I, I also get technical with it and call that, uh, you know, lowering the entropy of the consciousness. Mm -hmm. But all of these all of these things do make one consciousness, uh, you know, different than another because there are different levels of this evolution. And the more evolved, the lower the entropy, the more you are like love, then the more influence, the more power you have, the more, um, um, you know, other people look up to you and will tend to follow your lead. So, yes, it does make a, make a difference. And if you want to describe that as, you know, levels of vibration, then that's a metaphor that, that works for, for a lot of people.
Mm -hmm. Do you find sometimes that the um, uh, the scientific terminology and more new age terminology conflict at times, or do they complement each other? Do you have a do you find a, a, um, a kind of a uh, describe what that experience is like for you as a NASA scientist, somebody who works in that kind of, you know, very academic kind of field, working with some of the concepts such as higher consciousness, which can, which can tend to go into more new agey kind of places. How do you how do you work with that in your work? Well, you know, the, the new age community um, have to express their concepts and their ideas with a language that's common, and with a language that they understand, and and uh, you know, science, on the other hand, tends to be a little more specific, a little more precise in the way they define things. And it doesn't matter a whole lot in the sense that what matters most is that we communicate. So if I say, you know, you know, how are your vibes or, you know, you're raising the, the, uh, the frequency of your, of your understanding or something, you know, use words that are not precise from a, from a technical viewpoint. As long as you understand what I mean, then we've communicated. So it's that sort of thing. Uh, I won't say these words are, are wrong and people shouldn't use them. They're fine as long as they are, they're communicating. But the words tend to be fuzzy and nonspecific, and they kind of, they're metaphors, and they give you an idea of what's being talked about without really being specific. The problem is if people take them to be literal rather than understand them as metaphors, then they get themselves kind of twisted up around a, a belief that just isn't true. Mm -hmm. Such as, you know, consciousness is vibrating. You know, consciousness is not physical. It doesn't move. There's no space and, you know, it doesn't vibrate. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you uh, believe that non, uh, you know, like non-human things have consciousness such as plants and, uh, you know, those kinds of, of things in the world, rocks, uh, a lot of shamanic cultures talk about these kinds of things having consciousness. I'm curious to know what your opinion is about that. Okay. Well, when it comes to um, to sentient beings, which would be almost all of what we find in the animal kingdom, right? So, you know, not only dogs and cats and monkeys, but things like bumblebees and and uh, you know squirrels and other things that we don't necessarily think of as as perhaps uh, you know with consciousness. But all of those animals have consciousness. They're all aware. They all interact. If you do one thing, they react to that with something else. They have choices. Maybe tiny choices. You know, a clam doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of choices, maybe other than to open up its shell or stick its foot out or pull it in or something like that. But they do have some choices, and there's a tiny little bit of consciousness there. It's not all just hardwired, um, uh, you know, hardwired things. They can learn. They they can uh, do things a little differently. So the, if you have choices, then you have consciousness. Now, when we talk about plants and rocks, that's in a little different class. It's not the same thing. Rocks don't make choices, and uh, trees generally don't make choices either. They just kind of grow where they grow. They don't uh, have a lot of choices to make. So it's a different kind of consciousness, and I would say that, that we call the first consciousness, that's what most people think of as being conscious, being, uh, you know, having an intellect, being able to make decisions, and that the rocks and the and the trees have a let's say, a feeling rather than intellectual consciousness, have a feeling consciousness. So they can be associated with certain energy forms. They can, uh, you know, have memory in the sense that things are associated with them. But it's not really that the rock has memory. It's that memory is associated with that rock. So the rock and the memory can be associated in the, in the uh, larger uh, database or Akashic Records, if you like. Mm -hmm. So they do, they do have um, kind of a very fundamental level of feeling awareness, but I wouldn't really say they're conscious in the same sense that you and I are conscious or the dog or a bird is conscious. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you wrote about an interesting experience that you had with Bob Monroe and a series of experiments um, 
where you did out of body meditations and you were actually separated in a room with another person. Um, could you talk, do you know, do you, I think I had talked to you about this before we actually decided to do the show that I wanted to talk about this tonight, um, where you were actually involved in this experiment and you had out of body experiences and then shared or recorded your experiences in the, each other's rooms, you know, in the separate rooms. And then you compared notes basically when you got out and a lot of the experiences you had were very, very similar. Would you care to talk about that for the listeners and, and myself? Sure, Cause I'm very sure. curious to hear about that too. Yeah, I would be glad to share that. And, and it, not, it didn't just happen one time. This was something that uh, occurred with me and, and several other people. And then between those people, other people as well, this was a kind of a set of experiments we did for a while while I was working with Bob Monroe at the labs. And it was an idea of Bob's to do it. Uh, the person that I, that I first had this experiment with was Dennis Menerick, and he and I were kind of Bob's uh, scientists uh, at large at his at his lab, so we came out and very routinely, uh, oh, many, like uh, three or four days a week, we would come out for four or five hours, six hours sometimes, and help Bob man and, and instrument his lab, and uh, he would then, to reward us for that, would teach us what he knew about out of body. And after a couple of years of this, to where Dennis and I were, you know, switching in and out of body pretty much at will, and had been doing exploring and healing and, you know, reading numbers off of blackboards and other kinds of tests because testing was what was important. Bob had this idea that Dennis and I, and he didn't discuss this ahead of time with us. We just showed up at the lab one night and he said, hey, I want you both to, to get in your respective booths. And these booths were soundproof. Um, he called them check units. They were just tiny little rooms with water beds in them, microphones suspended from the ceiling down over our mouths. And he had taught us, we had trained to be able to talk while we were in the out-of-body so we could actually parallel process between the out-of-body state and the physical state, and we'd go do something, and we'd come back and tell Bob what we'd done, and we'd go do something, and that's how we reported, because if you wait until after it's all done, there's a whole lot that you forget. It's much better to, to uh, talk as you go. Some of our sessions would be several hours, and over several hours it gets the details start to get lost. So anyway, Dennis and I were in these separate units, we could not hear each other. We each had microphones, so Bob could hear us independently. He could talk to both of us at once, or he could talk to each of us independently. And uh, his instructions were that we should go out of body, go above the roof of the lab, meet there, and then go off on an adventure together, but stay together. So what he was doing, meanwhile, is he was asking each one of us independently, what are you doing? You know, what did, what did you just, you know, what are you seeing? What are you interacting with? What's going on? So he was asking me those questions and separately asking Dennis those questions and recording both of our answers on a cassette tape. So we went on an adventure, kind of typical for us. We were doing this pretty regularly with him then. And we met above the lab, and we kind of went off together, and we had conversations with each other. We uh, had conversations with other non-physical beings. We saw things, went places, uh, went to some other reality frames. It was a pretty eventful uh, situation where there should have been a lot of evidence whether or not we were hearing and seeing and doing the same thing. So afterwards, probably oh, at least an hour and a half, maybe two hours or so, you know, he ended the, he ended the session, and Dennis and I come staggering out of these, these booths. Of course, the, the light kind of nearly blinds you there for, for a few seconds, and we went up to the control room, and Bob looked at us, and you have to know Bob Monroe, but he, he had a kind of a sardonic uh, humor, and he looked at us with a kind of smile on his face and nodding his head and says, well, do you two really think you were together? And we uh, kind of looked at each other and said, yeah, it seemed like it to me. And Dennis said, yeah, well, it seemed like it to him too. So we said, well, let's, and he said, well, listen to this. And he flipped two switches at the same time for these two cassette tapes, and there was my replies and Dennis' replies to his question playing back simultaneously. And there we were talking to each other. You know, we were having this conversation. First it would be Dennis, you know, and then it would be me. He was flipping back and forth between us, asking us things. Um, of course, we didn't know that he was doing that. He, we just know that he was asking us questions. So that was, a, that was probably the most amazing thing that had happened to me up at that point. Um, you know, when you do this sort of thing, there's a, there's a point where, you have an experience that you cannot deny and also cannot explain. Now, we had done a lot 
that defied statistics. We had done things that then we the statistics said were, you know, one in a thousand or one in a million or something like that, that it was random, that we could have gotten the data. But that's all intellectual. When I did this, it hit me below the, the intellectual belt to a, a place that's deeper. And that was kind of the big turning point for me. And that, uh, you know, I spent the next the next several weeks just kind of wandering around in a, in a partial days saying over and over to myself, my God, this stuff is real, mm. you know, because there was no other explanation. And until you get to that personal experience, it is, oh, yeah, we can do things that are way off the statistical charts, but, you know, you just don't have a sense at the, at the base gut level that it's really real. You still wonder. And uh, this was a big turning point for me. And it didn't turn out to be that big of a deal for Dennis. He remembers it pretty well, but it wasn't the the big cathartic uh, aha moment for him that it was for me. And then I did the same thing maybe a couple of weeks later with uh, who was then Nancy Lee Honeycutt. That was Bob's stepdaughter and who's now uh, Nancy Lee Monagle, Joe Joe, uh, Monagle's wife. And... um, we had a similar kind of thing. We went up and met and, and went off and had experiences, and then later the experiences just laid out perfectly. We were having the same conversations and seeing the same thing. So it's a it's a thing that you can do once you get proficient, or at least two of you are proficient. At, hmm. uh, out of would you together. would you care to describe the technique that you use when you do this when you work with another person? Well, in this case, our technique of going out for body together was just to meet someplace. So we would just meet in the out-of-body state, and then once we were in the out-of-body state, it was a matter of staying together, and you just do that with your intent. And both of us intended to be with the other one, so uh, when we'd say something like, well, you know, let's go off and see what happens, and we just kind of zing off into the into the uh, you know great void there, but we'd mm-hmm. stick together, and then uh, we would see things and, and interact with things together, just like you know, we were together, just like uh, just like we felt we were. So what mm-hmm. that does, and the reason it hit me so hard, is that tells you that the data that you're receiving, it is your interpretation that's true, but there is objective data out there. And even though you have an obje- you have a subjective interpretation, and you could see that between Dennis and I, that we would interpret things a little differently, like, like people do. And uh, that was obvious, but it was also obvious that we were looking and describing very similar things, you know, sizes, shapes, colors, function, all that kind of stuff was the same, even though, you know, the, the details might have been a little a little different. Mm-hmm. So would you designate, you know, for example, a place that had common meaning to both of you, or would it just be a random place, and then in your mind go into a meditation where you projected yourself at that place, and then would you conversate between each other, or would you have the experience and then go back and talk about it after? No, we we uh, actually wouldn't meet. Uh, Bob's instructions were meet above the lab, so we just we just uh, kind of floated up out of our bodies, went up above the lab where we could look down and see the roof of the lab. And while we were floating up there, we we intended to connect and see each other, which we did. And then uh, from there, so that's how we got together to begin with, and from there we started. But it doesn't have to be that you meet some place. You can go and and kind of connect with another person just with the intention of doing so. And if that other person is also intending to meet with you, then the two of you basically get together. Mm-hmm. And you can uh, do things together, and you communicate with each other uh, telepathically. Huh. And so when you, uh, let's say the other person, you know, you're trying to contact somebody and you can't reach them physically, um, and you want to project your consciousness uh, to communicate with somebody, how would somebody perceive that kind of communication that perhaps wasn't aware that it was being done well, on the other they, end? Uh, yeah, it depends on how how aware they are. Let's say they're not particularly aware at all. You know, you're just going to, uh, you know, visit somebody, and they're not expecting you or, or whatever. They're not really aware. They're They're busy doing something else. Maybe they're busy playing a game of basketball or something that takes a lot of concentration on their part. You know, they're not just sitting relaxed, uh, kind of dreamily wandering off in a meditation state, but they're doing something. Well, what would happen is that you would communicate with them. You could talk with them. You could carry on a conversation, and they would get it. They would get the whole content of what it was you were saying, but they would sense it 
if they were more sensitive, they would sense it as their own intuition. They'd say, you know, it'd be like a voice talking in their head, and they'd assume that that was them. That was their own, you know, talking to themselves, their own intuition talking to them. If they were less uh, aware, they would just kind of get the idea. They'd get the big picture of what you were saying, and that would now just kind of be an idea that they had. And they would, of course, think that it was their own idea. Mm-hmm. So they wouldn't be aware that you were talking to them, but they would take the information in. And you can do this basically with anyone that uh, you wish to give information to. You can have those kinds of conversations, and they do get the information. And if it's information they can use, they often will act on it. So for a person who's sitting around watching TV on a, you know, Monday night and they're just kind of hanging out and all of a sudden somebody crosses their mind, could that be a kind of, you know, like a, a psychic phenomena? You know, they would consider that a psychic phenomena where they just kind of think, oh, I was just, you know, because a lot of times people will say, oh, I was just thinking about you. And then that person calls and uh, or that person, you know, been crossing somebody's mind over the course of a, maybe a day or two. And uh, in that sense, and uh, could that be a, a, a result of that kind of phenomena? Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't have to be out of body. Like I say, we are in communication with each other all the time. So if there's somebody you're particularly, say, close to, you know, maybe um, a mother or father or son or daughter or something like that, something very, very big happens in their life, you're you're liable to know about it. You're liable to get this, this message that, oh, I need to call, you know, my dad and see what's going on. And you mm-hmm. call and you often find that there really was something going on. You know, you get that message. Other people that uh, just happen to kind of drift through your mind for no reason it's probably because that other person is thinking of you and that makes a that makes a connection or there's something there between the two of you that would be kind of uh, significant for you to know or understand and mm-hmm. you'll get that connection do you think so that too you don't have there... to go out of body to do this you, you don't it's not an out-of-body phenomenon that you have to do to do this it's just a matter of we're we're netted it's like everybody on the internet you know we're we're netted, whether we like it or not. The switch is open, and we we send and receive. Yeah, and do you think that um, I was going to ask you about the connection between two people? And I know a mother and a son. You know, any kind of connection that you have with your children, father, or children. Um, there's what they call a stronger intuitive psychic connection. So if there's something wrong with your child, parents will often feel it immediately and know something's not right. Um, and I'm wondering. Along the spectrum of how we are with people as far as our relationships go and how well we know, you kind of answered this already, but um, I guess that would kind of determine the quality of signs that might come in perhaps. Or I have an experience with a friend of mine who I don't talk to very often, but when I do, I can always tell when I'm going to hear from them. And I start to see things, um, you know, just walking along a, st- a street and, you know, I look up at a sign and it re- reminds me of something that has to do with that particular friend. And... I'll run into kind of synchronistic events that kind of keep reminding me of this person. And then sure enough, every single time, 100%, I will hear from that person within, I don't know, 24 to 48 hours or so. And that's always been the case. And it doesn't happen with other people, to be honest with you. Like sometimes it's a different exchange. And so I guess, you know, you kind of already touched on this a bit, but I'm wondering, is there, when there's a stronger emotional connection, do you think that that affects the consciousness between people? Well, it's two different, you know, it can come from two different sources. If it's all coming, if the connection is mostly coming from your end, then yes, it probably is, is mainly has to do with the kind of the attachment or the connection you have with that person. And that attachment and connection you have with that person doesn't have to be just the connection that you have with them now, here in this physical matter reality. You may have been connected to that person in other, uh, you know, in other reality frames at other times. So it's, it's not a, it's not just that it has to be your, your son or your, you know, your father or mother or something like that. It just could be somebody with whom you are connected, with whom you have a, a resonance. And you will pick that sort of thing up because you're sensitive to their, energy to their being and what they're doing and if they're thinking about you you might then start thinking about them and then they they feel you thinking about them so then they you know think more about you so it tends to to build on itself like that but now it can go the other way that it's not necessarily you at all but it's somebody else so let's say um you know i uh 
decide to to talk with you and and uh, about some kind of maybe shared problem or some issue that you're having or something like that. And uh, I would come and and say, hey Hillary, you know, you know, we have this conversation. Um, you know, that would then you would get that message that I would give you. You may or may not know that I was giving it. It may just come across as your own thoughts, but that's me directing that at you. So this other person may be directing it at you, and that's why you pick it up, or it may be just you homing in on the fact that they exist and there's a resonance between you. So there's mm-hmm. a couple of things going on there. And now uh, at your workshop in London, um, you had done an interesting exercise for the group, and you had taken a look at a picture that nobody else in the audience saw, and you it, you project it. You you I guess you imagine that picture in your mind, and you ask people to uh, draw that picture and see how close they could get. Um, is is that a common thing that most people can learn how to do? Is that a skill that people can learn how to do? This this kind of psychic phenomena where, you know, they picture something and and the rest of the people in the room can pick it up easily it, because you did that rather quickly in the exercise in the workshop. Um, that's that's the first part of my question. The second part of my question, I know you have a series of workshops coming up in California, and uh, at the end of the hour we'll get into exactly how people can find out more information about those workshops and join you. And they're phenomenal, by the way. I have to say, everybody listening, they're really, really great uh, things to gift yourself with if you're in an area and listening to Tom talk is very, very special. Um, but... I just forgot the second part of my question. I got so excited about your workshop. But anyway, getting back to the psychic phenomena, do you consider a lot of this psychic in that sense as far as, you know, the the remote viewing and the contacting people through consciousness? Um, Would you consider that psychic ability? Well, yeah, in a sense, you you know, that's just a matter of how we define terms. But, yes, um, you know, we can say that these are – you know, communications that are not physical. You know, there's no physical energy going back and forth. It's not electromagnetic waves or sound or, you know, light or anything like that. This this is uh, paranormal in the sense that it's outside of what's normal. But from another viewpoint, it's perfectly normal. When you see, when you understand the big picture, we are consciousness. You know, that that is our nature, and this is a perfectly normal thing for any consciousness to do. So yes, everybody can do this. It's not just special people who are born with the talent or special people who train really hard. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, um, can we say, it's just a, an artifact of being consciousness that you can communicate like this that mm-hmm. you can remote view. Most people aren't sensitive to it. They don't pay any attention to it. It's just noise in the background. What the, where the training comes in, it isn't to learn how to do it. It's basically to learn how to not block doing it. Because it's going on all the time anyway. You're just not aware of it. You can become aware of it. And typically when you do these kinds of exercises, the remote viewing, the seeing the picture, something like that, it's best to do it very quickly because people in their first few seconds, when they think about it, they're, they're not operating on it. The problem that, that uh, prevents people from being successful here is their own analytical sense. They, they they get an image and they say, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. You know, like the other day I saw one that somebody else had done and they had this little apple core in their pocket. And um, I guess it was, uh, Russell Targ did that. And he asked somebody, he says, I have something in my pocket. Can you tell what it is? And of course, the first thing the person did was he drew this picture of like a flower, you know, which was sort of the way this thing actually looked, except it was a flower inside a circle. And uh, But then you know, of course, one would think, well, flower. He obviously doesn't have a flower in his pocket. You know, that doesn't make any sense. So then you <laughs> kind of erase that and you try to do something else. But that's a, that's a problem. We tend to get very analytical. We tend to think too much. We tend to have preconceived notions. We want to make sense out of it. And uh, that just is all the wrong things to do. You need to just have no preconceived notions, be open, and see what happens. And then you just... Just uh, report what happens like a scientist. You know, you don't try to say, oh, I only want to report it if it makes sense. I don't want to look like a fool. You just report whatever happens. And if you do that enough, you'll find that uh, you can kind of get a sense of how it is you're doing it and making that connection, and you can make the connection stronger. So that's how people get better at it. It's just a matter of 
practicing, but the attitude is more important than anything else. Yes, everybody can, everybody can do this. Yeah, I agree with that, and I and I really make a point to to make that one of my big messages when I deal with my uh, my my events and stuff too. Is that it, it's not about being special. It's not about being, you know, able to do something other people are not able to do. Nobody's on a pedestal. This is just something that is. I really believe it's ingrained in being human. I think it's one of our pretty much natural ways of communicating with each other. Now I'm going to go back real quick um, to talk about something that kind of extends off what you were speaking of before with your experiments and your big aha moment when you realized that this was real. Um, you talked, uh, I believe you talked about uh, meeting other beings and other, quote, dimensions that you, um, it, it, is that something that you've experienced yourself? Is it something that other people have experienced and you have yet to experience? What, what, what's your comment on uh, other beings, other dimensional beings that we can communicate with in an out-of-body state? The reality is a very big thing. You know, it's a very big thing. Our, our reality here, our universe, is just a tiny little speck of it. You know, we're not the we're not at the center of it, and uh, you know, we're not by any means you know the larger part of it. We're just a little speck. Reality, as consciousness evolves, and just like any evolving system, it basically fills every niche that can be filled with anything that can that can be sustained in that niche. So this is our little niche, our universe, you know, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a virtual reality. But there are a lot of others. There are many, many, many other reality frames besides this reality frame. And we visit some of them routinely, like the dreaming frame. That's another reality frame that we work in. So that's two that most people get in and out of. But you'll find out that there's, there's literally hundreds of these reality frames. And some of them are what I call physical-like, which means they have constraints, they have rule sets that constrain them to um, to being something like our physical reality. You know, things have a have a process. You know, you have causality there that's that's obvious. And then there are other uh, reality frames, and these are all virtual realities. Consciousness is the only thing that's fundamental. All these other frames are, are virtual frames. That's our, our our universe is a virtual frame. Mm -hmm. So you have other uh, virtual frames like uh, where we where we end up after we pass out of this frame is a virtual reality that is made particularly for transitioning from, from this reality. There's a little part of that that we do. And then there's a larger frame that the out-of-body people travel around in. And all of these are different frames, but they're all populated. There's, there's you know, like I say, uh, something consciousness produces beings, you know, just like our environment produces you know, animals, plants, and and uh, and other things. You know, it fills almost every niche. So you'll find all sorts of beings. You can interact with these beings. You can communicate with them. You can uh, go to where they live. You can join them if you like in their in their um, in their reality frame. And you can do that either by just kind of telepathically communicating with them, and in other case, you're a voice in their head, or you can actually uh, uh, manifest a body like theirs and go and go join them and interact with them in that way too it's it's um, it's just something that's available to everyone to do yes a lot of people do do it uh that's what mediums are doing when they're uh, you know talking to uh uh spirits or whatever they're they're connecting in that case probably to the uh, to the database that uh, has all the data in it if it's particular people who have been here but um you can just visit these places. Now, the, the thing that's that's a little um, difficult about it, I guess I should say, is that it's your intent that gets you places. And if you don't know that something exists, how can you intend to go there? So it's one of these things that you have to explore a little bit at a time. It's just like any other exploration. You know, you don't know where you are or, or where, you know, what's on the other side of that hill, but the only way to find out is you go and look. So you, as you interact with other beings, you know, they take you places and then that becomes some place you know. And then you make more friends and they take you places and that's another place you know. So eventually, I've been doing this for like 40 years, you've kind of been around a bit and you have a lot of acquaintances. And, uh, <laughs> you've seen, you've seen a lot of big circle of friends. <laughs> yeah, big circle of friends. So it does. It does uh, grow like that, and some of them it pays actually off. It pays off to visit. Different. We actually have a caller. We have a question uh, from Jane in Arizona. Hi, Jane. Thanks for waiting. You have a question for Tom? 
I do. Thank you very much for taking my call. My question is um, about telepathic, you know, communicating with one another. I often find, um, you know, that I pick up on people's thoughts or people's messages, people who just kind of, you know, like, I want this or that or the other from Jane, and I pick up on it, and then before I know it, I'm on the phone calling, and I'm saying, hey, I got this message that I was supposed to call you and do this, that, and the other, and it happens a lot. So, you know, a lot of times also, you know, I intuitively just pick up on, again, you know, something that somebody may want from me <laughs> or want me to do or think they need something from me, and, again, I intuitively pick up on it, but sometimes there are things that I don't want to connect with or don't want to hear, and I so I'll sit there and have a telepathic, you know, conversation with whomever, and I'll say, okay, cancel, clear, delete, you know, because I don't want to have a conversation. But it happens a lot, and I find that it's almost like a, like an intuitive or an invasion, a spiritual or an intuitive inv invasion, and I'm just trying to figure out, like, how do I work with that? That's a great question. Okay, well, so the way you work with that is you can open that channel up or you can close it down based on your intent. You don't have to receive those signals that you don't want to. You just have to form a very clear intent that uh, anything that you are not interested in, and you can kind of give a general description of what that is, that you just don't want to hear about it, and it will shut that it will shut that down. Now, if you have an attachment to it, if you have a fear of it, if it's something that uh, you think you cannot turn off, then you probably won't be able to turn it off because that will be a, a belief, and, and uh, that belief will be fulfilled. You know, we, again, we we uh, we create our own reality. So just be steady uh, in your meditation, and when your mind is still and calm, make a very clear statement about what it is you do not want to receive. And if you keep that in your mind as you as you uh, Go through your day. I think you'll find that those things will get fewer and fewer, and then and then drop off. And you can do the same thing with the things you want to receive. You have those in your mind, and that signal will get clearer and stronger. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I agree. You know, because there are times, you know, when I'll say, "Oh, clear, clear, delete." I don't want to have a conversation with whomever. I don't want to talk about this subject. And a minute or two will go by, and then it goes away. But then, you know, as soon as I'm in a different space or a different energy, all of a sudden I can feel like a, a person's energy come in and begin talking with me and just say, you know, and then I'll have to go through that whole process again, that clear, 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 delete, delete, you know, because so far that's the only way I've been able to clear out certain energies that I don't want to have a conversation with, but it happens a lot. Well, you probably have. <laughs> have created this little ritual with yourself of what you go through in order to, you know, banish the uh, the uh, communications you don't want, and you don't really need that ritual. That's just something you've kind of gotten into because it worked. You tried it, and it worked, so then you do it again, and pretty soon you kind of get dependent on that. If you, if you try other methods that are simpler and easier and uh, last longer, those will work as well. So don't get trapped in, in uh, what just happened to work for you. There are ways that'll that'll be more efficient. You can set up a, a thing in your in your mind that will prevent that even from from getting started. Um, any suggestions? <laughs> I was just going to say, well, Tom, like, give her some give her some hints here. <laughs> well, it's like the it's like the affirmations that uh, people use. You know, they'll they'll start out when they're meditating and they'll say, "I don't want to you know uh, communicate with anybody who doesn't have my." best interests at heart or some sort of thing like that. You know, that's, that wasn't very elegant, but you've, you've heard these affirmations. Right. It's something like that. You, you write up something that's very specific about what it is you don't want to hear, and then you just put those thoughts in your mind and refuse. You know, you just say, I'm, you know, I don't want to. I'm going to refuse anything that doesn't meet this criteria, and that will, that will work. And you mm. can, you, you can uh, just write your own. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of intent. Intent is what is the active ingredient in all these things, whether it's remote viewing or healing or uh, out of body. Intent is the driver. That's what. That's Tom, what makes can I can happen. I can I can I interrupt here for a second? Now, when you say mm -hmm. intent, believe it or not, there's a lot of people out there who don't really get what that means. Um, when you when someone says it's your intent, it's your intent. Okay, well, if I wish it or if I think it or something, can you can you maybe 
describe a little more deeply for people who may not really, you know, understand what that means? Um, okay. Jane, I'm not saying that's you. I'm just saying in general. Actually, a oh, lot no, of people you, you will totally ask that question. With me. Yes, you're, you're totally connected with me there, and that's exactly what it, that was going to be my next question is, like, describe intent because I feel like I'm putting the intention out there, you know, and I do my best to, like, um, not push away anything. I try to stay open to everything because I feel like that which I push away is is actually something I need to learn about so that I can evolve it, you know, evolve my own consciousness so that I, I'm not, like, in this place of fear because I feel like those things that I push away are things that I'm saying, I don't want to learn about that, that's yucky, unattractive, or I just don't want anything to do with it, so I try to push it away, and instead of me push it, pushing it away, I'll say, okay, well, let me take a look at this, try to understand it so that I can evolve it instead of pushing it away, you know, because I feel like that's why it returns, you know, and so I try to face things so that I can have an understanding, but intention, yes, I, I need to understand intention. <laughs> your, your intent has to be more specific. It has to be very clear, and by that I mean it has to have no noise, and that's kind of a now a different concept. Um, you know, when you meditate, the, the meditation is a is a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool, and you generally use that tool to learn how to quiet your mind, to get the noise out of your thoughts. Otherwise, when you first try to meditate, thoughts keep coming in all the time. Well, that's what I'm describing as noise. It's all the stuff that your mind and your consciousness is doing. All the things you're thinking about operating on is, is noise. Once you get rid of all of that noise, what you have left is just pure, still consciousness. That's what I call the void state. When all the noise is gone and you are sitting meditating, your body's gone, this reality's gone, all the thoughts are gone, and you are a point of consciousness floating in the void. Now, at that point, you're... Your intent, what you want to do, is a clear, pure signal. So that's one thing. You have to get rid of the noise. Otherwise, you know, your intent is jumping all over the place. You may be thinking something, but at the same time, you've got hundreds of thoughts buzzing around in your mind, and it doesn't come out clear, and therefore it doesn't carry much power. So that's one thing. You need to get rid of the noise so that your 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 mind is focused. The second thing is your intent has to be very precise. It has to be clear. You can't be saying... I want to be open to everything, but I don't want to be open, you know, to everything. <laughs> if you have general intents like that that conflict with each other, then that's a problem. You have to say, mm -hmm. I want to be open to these kinds of things, very specifically what it is you want to be open to, and I don't want to be open to these things, very specific, exactly what that is. As long as you have general intents, I intend to be open, well, then you're going to be open because you follow intent. If you say, I want to be closed off, then you may not get things you want. You need to be more specific than that. But first, your intent has to be very clear and very focused without noise. Otherwise, it, it's not as, uh, it doesn't carry as much power. Yeah, you know what I was thinking as, as Tom was talking, Jane, a good example of this, uh, in my manifestation classes, I often teach people to be very specific. Like, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I want a relationship. Okay, well, you know, or, or let's, let's use a car. I want a new car. Okay, what color car? What kind of car? And be as absolutely specific right down to like even the most kind of, you know, would seem unimportant kind of detail. And it helps to create, you know, and I'm going to use different terminology because Tom and I come from kind of the same place, but different male-female perspectives. <laughs> I use it as, you know, attaching cords of energy and kind of going into uh, places where I, I visualize it and I bring it up and I think about it. And then I let it go and I don't attach to it. And I stay clear and focused on what I'm doing. And I find that the more specific I am on the things that I want to, when I'm creating an event, you know, I will be very specific with the intention of the the event, I will be clear, you know, and, and concise with, with a venue where it's going to be held and those kind of things. So it, it, it's kind of the same thing when we're, you know, holding space for ourselves. One of the things I do um, when I'm kind of in the same situation as you, Jane, is I call in, you know, kind of a circle of light and I, you know, I say prayer and I say, so, you know, nothing is allowed into this circle that is not of my highest good. And that seems to kind of disperse anything that, you know, I don't want in my circle, and it keeps things out. And I visualize that as kind of like a ring of power around me that uh, protects me, and that works for me. That's my intention, and that's what I that's what I connect to. Um, and so maybe that might be of – does that help, you know, what Tom and I have? We've kind of just kind of explained the, the, the intent. 
Yes, most <laughs> definitely. And I and I totally align with the whole intent thing. I totally. And um and I'm gonna try that, you know, with the circle of light because um again, you know, I can I can be meditating, I can be cooking or cleaning or taking a drive from here to there and then all of a sudden you know, I'll just have like this spiritual invasion of energy and it's like, No, go away, I don't wanna talk to you <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, okay, this is happening a little more often than I want it to happen, and I was trying to figure out how do I keep that. You know, I don't want to have a telepathic community or a conversation with someone, and how can I, you know, keep that, And you know, outside of calling up that person and saying, stop talking to me spiritually, intuitively, because I don't want to talk with you, which I've done, you know, but, <laughs> you know, but it happens a lot. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out, you know. aware that this these things are tools. The things, you know, yeah. the, the circle of light. Uh, people can put a balloon of light around them. Uh, people can re- erect walls that are barriers. All of these things are tools. And what the tools do is they focus your intent. That's the purpose yeah. of the tool. And you can make up your own tools. You know, you can build a wall around yourself, or you can, <laughs> uh, you know, have a have a certain sign or symbol or something that wards off, you know, unwanted conversation. It doesn't matter the tool you use as long as that tool is something that you connect with and therefore it focuses your intent. So, again, it comes right back to intent, and many of us can't focus our intent without tools. We need these tools to Mm -hmm. give us a visualization, to give us some kind of feeling or something, and uh, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. So make up tools. Make up whatever, whatever works, but find something that works for you, and what Hillary does might work for you or might not. You may have to experiment some until you find something that kind of resonates with you and that would be the best choice yeah definitely <laughs> that was Thank a great that was a great question jane thanks so much for calling we i really appreciate that i'm sure that helped a lot of people listening tonight thank you so much you. um Tom, we have about we have about a minute left in the show and what i usually do at the end of my shows is i ask my guest uh to talk briefly in about you know 40 seconds or less what is your main hope for the intention of your work as it reaches out across the, you know, the world through your readers and those that listen to your lectures? What is, what is your main hope? Well, my main hope would be that people find it useful. You know, I see it as news you can use, you know, not just uh, theory that's there to name things, but uh, this is, this is uh, ideas that you can put to work in your personal life, understandings that will help you uh, not only understand why you're here and, and what the point of your existence are, but how you're connected to everything else. Mm. And uh, so that, that's my hope, is that people yeah. will find it useful and will go use it. Well, I wanted to mention real quick before we end the show, you have some upcoming workshops coming up. You have, you'll have you be speaking in Campbell, California, February 20th and 21st. Right, Costa Mesa, right California, in February of uh, 27th and 28th, and you'll be in New York City May 1st and 2nd. Um, so right. if people want to find out more information about these events, they can go to the MBT, MyBigToeEvents.com, and they can find out the information on how to register and all the great events. And I highly suggest if you have an opportunity to meet Tom in person uh, and attend one of these events, it's, it's well worth your time and effort to get to these workshops. So, Tom, good luck with everything. Thing. I will see you in New York. I will be down there joining you in New York. And oh, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and taking an hour to speak to us about these great theories. And I had a lot of things I really wanted to get into, but we didn't. And so I guess we'll just have to bring you on again and talk about <laughs> some of the other great stuff you're doing. <laughs> an hour is so short. Well, it's our belief system. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Everybody so listening, uh, thank you so much for joining me. 